Nicole, history was made with the first ever successful commercial moon landing, but got a little complicated just as the lander was uh, touching down. What do we know about that moment? Well, it was a real nail biter uh, for certain. Uh, they moved the landing time. We didn't understand why, but later it turns out that um, the laser that was being used to land, to uh, you know, find a safe place to land, didn't actually work. Um, and that is an instrument built by MDA. But it wasn't that it actually they found out didn't work. It was that a safety switch was left on. Uh, um, so it's kind of like the safety to a firearm and that was left on there was no way to correct it and then it uh we had some ca communication issues and we found out that the lander now is on its side it's tipped over because it caught its leg on something but the you know the the uh, payloads are doing well and the science is being done so a happy ending okay uh, bob the landing uh, took place near the moon's south pole why there specifically well, there's a couple of reasons, Ian. And uh, again, uh, just to support Nicole, it's always that last meter that gets you, isn't it? You know, you're, you're safe all the way there, and then you trip just at the last second. But they want to go to the South Pole because there's good evidence that there's ice at the bottom of craters that never see the sun. The sun's very low on the horizon at the South Pole, and it doesn't reach the bottom. So they think there's water ice down there. And water is a huge resource on the moon, both as drinking water for people that go there, and it's made of hydrogen and oxygen. So when you break water apart, you've got rocket fuel. So it's a very valuable resource, and the South Pole is going to be the target for future missions, including putting people there. The second reason is that astronomers would like to put a telescope on the South Pole of the Moon to look at the universe. And there's another Canadian instrument there, a little camera that was supposed to look up and take pictures of the Milky Way and then send them to the Earth. Uh, this was built in Toronto, and just a proof of concept that you can do that. But now that this thing's lying on its side, I, I don't know which way it's going to be pointing. But at, at least Canada's up there. We're part of this, and I think that's really important. I, I love the fact that you very casually say, and that water could be used for people to drink when they're on the moon. Yes, maybe one day that's uh, <laughs> what it will do. Um, Nicole, as, as we can tell from Bob's uh, tone and yours, this is an exciting time. Uh, we seem to be headed towards a, a kind of boom in, in space exploration. How is Canada positioned right now for this? Very well. I, honestly, we've been in a great position uh, for decades since the, you know, the start of the space programs. Um, you know, we we have instruments that are have flown everywhere. We've, I mean, James Webb Space Telescope, for example, we have major contribution to that. We've had instruments on Mars, uh, you know, uh, going to asteroids. It's a very robust industry here in Canada, and people, I think, tend to forget that we do not, you know, like every. People know the Canada, right? Um, and that's, of course, important. But we are everywhere. And, um, you know, we really should be tooting our own horn. So, Bob, another thing that's going on here is private companies involved in travel to space. And, and I guess the, the philosophy is, at least theoretically, is that they can do this more cheaply than government agencies, more efficiently. What's your view on that? They certainly can, Ian, and this is the future. It's the way it's going to go. NASA is a government organization, and the way they've been going to the moon in the past is by using it as a make-work project. They involve a lot of different states, a lot of different companies, which means a lot of people, that all those parts have to be brought together in Florida and then flown. This new mega rocket that's going to be taking Jeremy Hansen to the moon is going to cost $4 billion every time it flies, and it only flies a couple of, couple of years, and it's thrown away way. SpaceX, on the other hand, the private company is flying every week now, and they're doing it for 10 times less because everything's under one roof. So yes, they can do it cheaper. It reminds me of big airplanes that were developed during the war as bombers. Then after the war ended, those same companies turned those four engine planes into airliners, and now we have the airline industry. So space is going through the same thing, going from the government science to the private sector, and I think it's a good way to go, as long as we don't have daredevils trying to take chances. Nicole, let's uh, continue the theme of uh, the enormous amounts of money that are involved in this industry. The, the Canadian government announcing $2.5 billion in funding. Now, that is spread over the next 14 years, but it's still a lot of money. So, so what do you say to someone who's watching tonight and might be saying that that money would be better spent somewhere else? Well, you know, it's, it's it's important to put that in perspective. That's over 14 years. Um, the annual budget is 
585 million. That's less than a percent of our annual budget, uh, the federal budget. But the, the other thing people need to realize is we have things that come out of that. It's estimated to provide, you know, up to 9,000 jobs across the country, provide $2.3 billion in GDP. You know, it, it, and things come out of that. I mean, the technology that's, you know, that um, that's used in the Canadarm, that actually is being used in neurosurgery. Uh, there are so many other spinoffs. Right now, uh, the Canadian Space Agency has a big push at uh, trying to use health applications that'll be used in remote communities, as well as in space. So we, there is a return that we're seeing, for sure. And, and Bob, what's coming next? What are some of the projects the Canadians will be involved in? Well, we're going to continue to build instruments that will be going out to other planets. As far as the moon goes, well, we've got Jeremy Hansen, who's going there next mm -hmm. year. Uh, Canada will be building a Canadarm3. There's another space station that they're planning to build in orbit around the moon called Gateway, and it will have uh, another Canadarm on that. And we're building rovers for the moon's surface, so we're going to still be part of the space program well into the future. As Nicole says, we've been doing it since 1962, and uh, we'll always be there. Bob, one more thing. We're making such a, a deal, I guess, as we should, about this, uh, this landing on the moon. But uh, we've been landing on the moon for a long time. We certainly have, Ian. In fact, this is deja vu for me because when I was a kid, I watched the very first American soft landing on the moon called Surveyor 1. That was 1966. And it was a three-legged robot, just like this one. So for me, we're kind of back there. We went to the moon in less than 10 years. And the last time the Americans went there, it was with two people and a car. It was uh, Gene Cernan, the, the commander of Apollo 17, said, I lived on the moon for three days, and I had a house, a car, and a job. And he and Jack Schmidt were geologists, and they walked around, and they collected rocks, and they came back. So here we are now, 58 years later, and we landed a robot on the moon. Well, okay, it's great, but we're starting all over again in terms of moon exploration. This time by the private sector, let's see where it goes. I enjoy the <laughs> historical perspective, Bob. Bob McDonald, Nicole Mortolaro, thank you very much. Thanks.